You're watching FJTN, the Federal Judicial Television Network. Well, he's not violent or anything. Just lots of yelling. Once he pushed me and then twisted my arm this time. Really, he's a good man. We need him here. I don't abuse my wife. I love her. We've been together since high school. She comes from a broken family. Her father's a drunk, and I took her away from all that. How is a man supposed to keep his house together? I provide the money and the discipline. She cooks and she cleans. That's just the way it is. Good afternoon, and welcome to the Federal Judicial Center's broadcast on domestic violence awareness. My name is Phyllis Drum, and I'll be your facilitator for today's program. The purpose of today's program is to provide you with some tools that you might use if during the course of your regular duties you come across a domestic violence situation. We've packed a lot of material into this program today, and each of you should have before you a participant guide. We'll be using this as a reference tool during today's program, and you might want to also keep it after the program as a handy resource for yourself. Let's begin by taking a look at today's objectives on page two of your participant guide. The first objective that we'll be looking at today is describing the role that context plays in understanding domestic violence. Our second objective is to use interview techniques for assessment and case planning. The third is to describe characteristics of abusers and victims. And the fourth is to use supervision strategies that promote victim safety and hold abusers accountable for their behavior. To take a look at further, in further detail, about this topic, we've invited to our studio today a group of three probation officers that have experience dealing with domestic violence offenders. Our first is Kelly O'Keefe. Kelly is a senior U.S. probation officer in the Eastern District of New York in Brooklyn, New York. Kelly also serves as their domestic violence resource officer. Next, we have Nancy Halverson. Nancy is with the Adult Field Services in Hennepin County, Minnesota. She supervises 12 officers whose primary caseloads are domestic violence people. And our third is John Raymond. John is a senior U.S. probation officer as well as training coordinator for the District of Minnesota. John will also be serving as our moderator for today's program. I know that we have a lot of information to cover, so without further delay, I'll turn the program over to John. John? Thank you, Phyllis, and welcome to all of you joining us for today's program. Uh, as Phyllis stated, we have a lot of information to cover today. Uh, before we do that, though, there's just a couple comments I want to make about the focus of the program. First of all, as officers, we all know that our focus is generally on the offender, in this case, the abuser, and uh, holding them accountable for their, for their behavior. Um, the challenging thing about domestic violence cases, however, is that we also have to take into consideration the victim perspective and be aware of what those issues are and how to manage them. So today's program will be offender uh, focused, but victim sensitive. And then secondly, uh, the program will assume that uh, the male is the abuser and the female is the victim. Uh, as we all know, the most prevalent form of domestic violence is male on female violence. Um, and before we really get into any uh, deep discussion about how we manage these cases, we really need uh, to understand the dynamics of domestic violence. And uh, really, to get started, uh, we have to understand the context within which the violence occurs. So to get things started, I'm going to ask Nancy, um, you know, what, can you explain the importance of context and what that means for us? Well, those of us working in the criminal justice system are aware that most incidents that pass through our system are, are based on a single incident of guilt or innocence. But domestic violence tends to occur over a period of time with a range of behaviors and within the relationship. So to really understand the domestic violence and the risks and the kinds of uh, offender we might be dealing with, we have to look at the context of the violence. We have to look beyond the single incident that may have brought it to our attention. So when we think about context, we really want to focus on three things. The first being 
um, the intent, the offender's intent in his use of the violence. What was he intending to accomplish? Was he intending um, by the violence to, for example, um, keep somebody from leaving the room? Was he intending to punish his victim? Was he intending to control or to get his victim to acquiesce and do something that, uh, that he wanted her to do? So we need to look at the intent, the reasoning behind the use of the violence, what they expected to accomplish. Maybe he just did it because he could. Maybe he did it because it's, uh, it's uh, the way he handles any and all conflict he has. The second area we want to uh, consider is the meaning of the violence to the victim. We have to think, and, and this is where the victim I information becomes critical, we have to think what, what did this mean to the victim? When he pushed her, when he hurt her, whatever the behavior was, did she feel frightened? Did she feel humiliated? Was she demeaned? Did she feel like she had no options, that she had to acquiesce? Uh, what, what kind of feeling did it, it raise in her? Perhaps it was surprise because it's never ever happened before, she wasn't expecting it, and, um, or perhaps it made her angry because it was a, a new dynamic in the relationship. Those are the kinds of things to explore with a victim. Um, one example of a behavior that uh, we could uh, look at would be, for example, sending flowers. A perpetrator sends flowers to a victim. One victim might interpret that to mean he's genuinely sorry, he's apologizing, things will be better, he wants to, to keep the relationship together and things will improve. Another victim might interpret that entirely differently and interpret it as a sign that uh, this, this uh, offender is mocking her, is telling her that the court system can't keep him um, from contacting her. Um, it might be designed to send terror into her heart. So we really need to look at the, the uh, effect that the, the acts have on the victim. The third thing to consider is um, uh, I, the, the effect actually of the violence on the relationship. What happens from here? What kinds of accommodations does the victim make? Does she acquiesce? Does she stop doing whatever it is that her, her abuser did not want her to do? Does she remain even though she had uh, voiced an intention to leave? Does it lead to isolation? For example, does this, um, does this act keep her from doing things that she would want to or would ordinarily expect to do? What's the effect on other third parties? The children, for example, did they witness it? Um, were they victims as well? Um, how, how is the entire family impacted financially and socially by the violence? So those are the, the three things that, that um, we have to think about with context. And by looking at those three things, um, the purpose, the effect, and the, me the meaning and the effect, we can really get an idea of, of the different types of perpetrators uh, based on, on this co overall context of, in which the violence occurs. Well, within that context, I mean, you, you talk about types of abusers. Um, can you just elaborate a little bit more on, on what types we might be looking at? You know, I can. I think POs understand that not all perpetrators are equally, vi are equally violent or equally dangerous, but the literature identifies five types. The first being the batterer. The batterer being that person who is violent within the relationship, has power and control issues, expects to, uh, to use the violence to, to maintain the family, the relationship in the way he wants. The second uh, category might, uh, would be the fighter, and this is a person who uses violence interpersonally, but also might use violence in ver various contexts, both socially and, and we might see him in the criminal justice system for other kinds of offenses too. Um, a one-time assailant is the person who engages in a violent act, but there is no pattern of control within the relationship, no uh, power imbalance within the relationship. It is an isolated incident. The uh, mentally disordered type would be somebody who's suffering from a major mental illness and the violence um, comes out of, of that disordered uh, thinking. And the, the last one identified is the self-defender. And this is the person who uses violence, but only in response to violence. In other words, they would be uh, violent towards the person who batters them. Okay, thank you. Um, viewers, if you would turn to pages three and four of your participant manual, um, you're gonna find a list of the various types and risk factors associated with each type of abuser uh, in your manual. What I'd like you to do is just take a couple minutes and uh, review those amongst yourselves. Maybe think about the cases that you've dealt with and how they fit into those various categories. And also pay attention to the risk factors, paying attention to the similarities and differences uh, in each different type of abuser. We're going to just take a couple minutes for you to review that and then we'll be right back.
Okay, welcome back everybody. I hope you were able to take a look at those different categories and maybe identify with some cases that you've dealt with and, and kind of uh, see what you're dealing with. And also became hopefully a little bit more familiar with some of the risk factors uh, involved with some of those. Um, Kelly, I know, you know, as we were preparing for this broadcast, um, we had some discussion about the various types of abusers and, and whether what we were seeing on paper really fit with the reality of, of what we were seeing on our caseloads. And um, given your experience with the domestic viol violence caseload, um, you know, what, do you, what, do you, what are you seeing in your caseloads? Are they consistent with what we have here? Well, we've had experience with every type of offender. Um, we, uh, what I'd just like to say at the outset is not for officers to get stuck in trying to type their offenders, that this is really just a guideline. It's for their information. It's for um, um, background about the whole situation. Um, the most common type I think we see is the batterer. Um, reading about the escalation of violence reminded me of a case we had where um, we didn't find out about the domestic violence until the husband had thrown the wife down the stairs and broken her arm. At that point she was terrified and afraid he'd kill her and so then she brought it to our attention so that violence escalated there. Um, I also, we've had cases that where the violence has escalated all the way to the victim's homicide despite the best efforts of everybody involved. So that, uh, that escalating violence is a, is a key piece there with the batterers. Um, we don't really distinguish between batterers and fighters. We kind of treat those the same. And I guess the only thing I thought about with the, with the fighters is that if you've got someone in your case, so that maybe they don't have the, the documented history of domestic violence, but um, perhaps, you know, lots of disorderly conducts or they're getting in bar fights or, you know, they're just generally violent. I think it uh, is important for officers probably to take a, a closer look at their uh, intimate relationships and uh, you know you may have a domestic violence situation in your hand if you look at it a little bit closer. Right, I agree. Um, I can't think though of a one-time assailant off the top of my head. Nancy, do you have any examples of that? Well, in our caseloads there are a few and I, I want to say as a just sort of a caveat that actually there probably are very few one-time assailants but there are, and uh, even though the offenders may often say it's, a, it's an isolated incident and some victims may say that well, as well, you really have to dig deeper and make sure that there is, it, that the power and control piece is absent from the, the situation. But the case that comes to mind from our caseloads was a case of a, a guy I supervised who had pushed his wife. They were arguing over money. She had just discovered a $30,000 credit card debt she did not know he had, and it was related to his gambling and a big argument ensued and uh, he pushed her. She was furious. It had never happened before. She called 911. The police came and arrested him. And in that situation, we were able to identify no, um, no b imbalance of power, uh, really an isolated incident. The violence was an isolated incident in response to this really significant argument. And uh, the intervention strategy at that point is to really to deal with the stressor, and in his case, uh, a gambling assessment and referral. Well, you know, I'm thinking if uh, I came home with a $30,000 credit card debt, my wife wouldn't be too happy either. Yeah, so. no kidding. <laughs> um, the other thing that struck me about what we're dealing with here is um, the mental health cases that we're seeing more of. It seems like in recent years we've seen an increase in those cases. And I'm just wondering, um, in your experience with that increase in those cases, are you seeing a correlation in more domestic uh, violence cases as well? Well, we're, while we are all seeing more mentally disordered cases, we're not seeing more abusers with mental disorders. By, by mentally disordered, we're talking about major mental illness like schizophrenia. And it, we're not talking about personality disorders or lesser disorders. Um, statistics show that offenders with major medical disorders have the same rate of violence in that population as there is in the general population. Um, it's only really when the severely mentally disordered uh, offender stops taking his prescribed medication or adds substance abuse to the mix that uh, the violence may show up. And it's near to the people who are near to him, so it might be in a family member, and that's how that population gets on our charts. You mentioned the substance abuse piece of it, and I know just looking uh, at the risk factors associated with, uh, with the different types of abusers, um, it seems like across the board that that is a risk factor and, and maybe you could just talk a little bit about um, the role of substance abuse in domestic violence cases. Well, substance abuse is a trigger 
for acts of domestic violence. It doesn't cause domestic violence in and of itself. If someone has a propensity to domestic violence and you add a substance to that situation, you may exacerbate the violence. Um, physical violence is just one of the behaviors that abusers use to keep their victims under control. Um, it may be present, the physical violence may be present only when the offender's drinking, but you'll see those controlling behaviors um, all the time with, the, with these offenders. Well, and there's one that I th we didn't spend a lot of time on, the, the okay. self-defender. Is it, anything that you can add there as far as that's something you see a lot of? Or? Um, I don't see, we don't see a lot of that, and sometimes I don't think we pick it up, really. But um, the self-defender is where the woman is um, in a confrontation, a physical confrontation with her abuser, and she's the one who actually inflicts injury. But she's the, she was the victim of it. She's the one who's injuring her assailant, and if he walks away without an injury, it looks like she was the actual assailant. Assailant. So it's something to keep in mind that uh, you know that it might be just someone defending themselves. Anything to add to that, Nancy? Well, I, I think the literature does also say that that in those situations, self-defending violence can sometimes be very lethal as well. So maybe it would behoove us to think about some of the folks in our caseload, women in particular, perhaps who might be in a domestic violence situation that is unrelated to their probation, but might be significant in terms of needing to address in terms of a the probation issues. I think we've got a, a pretty good handle on context. Um, just understanding, uh, you know, what's going on in the relationship, what type of abuser you may be dealing with, and, and what we're going to do now is maybe just dig a little bit deeper into the dynamics of domestic violence. And probably one of the uh, most commonly used schematics to illustrate uh, the dynamics of domestic violence is the power and control wheel. And uh, viewers, you'll find that uh, wheel on page six of your participant guide. So if you'd turn there, please. And uh, Nancy, could you just uh, spend a couple minutes walking us through this uh, graphic? Yes, the, the power and control wheel was developed by interviews with hundreds of battered women. And the purpose of the interview was to get them to describe their experiences uh, in relation to the violence and, and its impact on their lives. So the, the wheel is designed to reflect those interviews. The uh, surrounding uh, part of the wheel is the violence piece and it's, it consists of sexual violence and physical violence and within it are the other kinds of behaviors that that contribute to the overall domestic violence in in that relationship. Um, some victims have said there may only need to be one violent act and thereafter any of these other behaviors in the middle of the wheel will be enough to um, maintain that fear or maintain that terror. The first um, spoke of the wheel is the use of intimidation. And this can be really overt or very subtle. It might be as subtle as a look, a gesture, um, a grimace, um, something that would assign a little note that might have a different meaning to the victim than we might think. Or it can be very overt, such as displaying of weapons or breaking things or injury to pets, those kinds of uh, things that are designed to intimidate to intimidate a victim and remind her of the violence that could be coming her way. The second um, spoke of the wheel is the use of emotional abuse. And that would be the put downs, the name callings, um, the, may, the victim made to feel like um, she is less than and that she's not equal and that, it, and that she isn't in a position to, um, to assist herself. It's also like really crazy making. Many victims say that they felt really crazy, really demeaned, very uh, unable to um, stand up for themselves. The third spoke is the the use of isolation as a technique and this is really huge because um, whenever you hear a client talking about jealousy or a victim talking about he's very jealous, the jealousy is a big piece because that jealousy or what they call jealousy keeps the victim from having relationships with other people, from maintaining relationships with her family, from maintaining relationships with friends and other third parties. These victims sometimes are not allowed to go to work, or if they do, they come straight home. They're monitored, their whereabouts, their comings and goings. Um, they're discouraged from maintaining normal family relationships, like especially with sisters and mothers. Um, so the uh, use of isolation is, is huge and obviously impacts the whole family. The fourth spoke is the minimizing and the denying. There is, there, this, this denial really can't be um, understated. This would be the offender who says it didn't happen, or it didn't happen like she said, or she started it. And, and conveying that to the victim. You started it. You were violent first. You were this. Well, you made me do it. Um, really shifting the, first saying, uh, 
it didn't happen or it didn't happen like you said or it wasn't as bad or it was your fault. So that's the, the technique there. The fifth spoke brings children into the equation and this is the really sad piece and kids get caught in this. They witness it, they go on to become um, abusers in some cases because of the witnessing. They suffer all kinds of, of, uh, of personal and emotional setbacks as a result of it. But the abuser can go so far as to threaten to take the kids, threaten to um, uh, kill the kids, uh, threaten to take the kids from her if she leaves, uh, threaten to kidnap the kids and leave. There's all kinds of really um, difficult uh, dynamics around kids in these situations on some occasions. The sixth spoke is male privilege. Male privilege is that sense that um, he is the king of the castle and he he gets to have things his way. It's just the way it is. Um, he can decide who goes where, who does what. He decides what the discipline is. He decides whether the dinner was good or bad. It's, a, it's really about him having that prerogative that is not anybody else's. He defines everybody else's roles. The uh, seventh spoke is the use of economic abuse. Many battered women um, don't have much say in how the money is spent in those situations. The abuser controls all the money. He would be the individual who cashes his check rather than put it into a joint savings or joint uh, checking account. He controls what money is spent and where. Even if she's allowed to work, and she may not be, but if she's allowed to work, her money still is not her own to spend. She would not have the discretion to decide how to spend money for that family. All of it has to be decided by him, and, uh, or at least uh, uh, reviewed by him. And the eighth spoke is the use of, of coercion and threats. And, you know, many of the rest reports that I read are loaded with threats. And I think we tend to hear them and think, well, it's just a threat. Well, a threat is really one aspect of the entire range of behaviors involved in domestic abuse. And some of those threats are very believable to victims. Other kinds of threats that we um, are aware of, and the coercion of, involves stuff like, you know, if you leave me, I will kill myself. If you leave me, I'll kill you. If you leave me, I'll take the kids. Um, those kinds of threats designed to coerce a victim into being, into, um, being subservient, um, doing what the perpetrator wants, not upsetting the apple cart or not leaving. When we look at all those spokes of the wheel, um, and they, they may, or not, may or may not all be present in a, in a battering or, or an abusive relationship, um, some or all of them may be there. We want to look at um, how, how intense they are, how frequent, um, you know, the severity and also the level of, level of fear that they might um, cause, I mean, in, within, to the victim. And those are the things that we would consider as we go through the, the uh, power and control wheel. When I, it just does a really nice job of illustrating all the different layers and the subtleties of domestic violence. And uh, I was really struck by uh, how useful this could be for officers. Um, you know, most of the time, the people we have in supervision, uh, you know, they're not on supervision for a domestic violence offense. They're on for something else, and the domestic violence might bubble to the surface later or might be something we're aware of. Um, but it seems like if you have a handle on this wheel, um, you can probably see the red flags when they come up, uh, identify situations as they arise, um, probably ask the right questions about what's going on so you can kind of sort it out and, and decide how you're going to deal with it. So I think it sounds like a really useful um, tool. I think it is. Yeah. I agree. Particularly when you're dealing with interviewing victims who are not necessarily going to always be so forthright and, you know, tell you all the details of what's going on in their lives. I mean, officers really have to be attuned to those telltale signs of domestic violence. Well, and uh, kind of staying on this line of discussion, we do have a videotape that's going to illustrate some of the things we've talked about up to this point. Uh, participants, what I'd like you to do is stay on page six with the power control wheel. And as we begin to go through the videotape, you know, just watch the exchange and uh, check off on the power and control wheel some of the dynamics that you see happening uh, in this scenario. And just to set this up for you a little bit, uh, what we have here is an officer doing an unannounced home visit uh, to one of his offenders. This offender is on supervision for stealing mail uh, from his job as a postal employee. He's been on supervision for about four months, and uh, there already have been uh, some minor violations. He's uh, met, uh, missed a couple of appointments. Uh, there's been some other technical violations. So the officer is making a visit just to try and get a handle on the situation. What the officer finds when he gets to the home is that the offender is not home, and he makes contact with the offender's wife, Megan. 
So let's watch and see what happens. Mrs. Miller, I'm Dane Williams. I'm Jared's probation officer. Is Jared here? No. He probably had to work late. We might be tied up in traffic. Could you come back another time? Well, I really need to see Jared today. He didn't show up for an appointment yesterday, and I just want to make sure everything's okay. Jared usually doesn't like for me to let people in the house when he's gone. But since you're his probation officer... Go back and play quietly with your sister. I'm fixing dinner. He likes it ready when he gets home. I've explained to Jared that while he's under supervision, I'll be stopping by here and also by his job. When I stop, you and I can talk, okay? He didn't say anything about that. Well, I'm glad we'll be able to talk. I can fill you in on some of the details. Go ahead and make dinner. Okay. I guess it's okay since it's part of his probation. So how have things been going with Jared and the family since he's been on probation? Okay, I guess. He spends more time with us since he doesn't have to work every day. How many kids did you say you had? Oh, three. Michael's five. Just started kindergarten this year. Uh, Michelle's three. And the baby just turned two. Jared wanted another boy this time, but I think he likes Andrea anyway. Sure do keep your house clean, Mrs. Miller. Are you a stay-at-home mom? Oh, I took a business course in high school before I got married, and, and I liked working. But Jared says he can support his family, and I should stay home and take care of the house and kids, so that's what I do. No. You know Daddy doesn't like for you to eat snacks and spoil your dinner. Looks like you hurt your arm. How'd that happen? Oh, uh, I fell on it. <laughs> Gee, where's Jared? Would you like for me to explain a little bit more about his probation? Yeah. He never tells me anything. Well, in order for him to successfully complete his supervision, he's got to stay out of trouble with the law. He can't use any drugs or alcohol. We'll have to bring him in for drug tests from time to time. He'll have to attend drug treatment, stay employed, and pay his restitution. He's learned his lesson. He's doing good. How would you describe your relationship with Jared? Oh, we've been sweethearts since high school. <laughs> He's always taking care of me. Since he was arrested, things have been hard. He can't work every day, and you know he lost his job because of this case. He's just worried about paying the bills and all. Do you two ever fight about anything? <sighs> all married people fight a little. What sort of things do you guys fight about? I know there was that harassment charge a long time ago. That must have been some fight. Oh, he doesn't get mad too often. Me and the kids try to keep him happy. And how hard is that? Well, I keep the kids quiet when he's home and make sure his dinner's ready on time and the house has to be clean, little things like that. Sounds like it would be pretty hard to do all the time, especially with three small children. Yeah, sometimes. That looks painful. Now, how did you say you heard it? Oh, I was carrying clothes up the basement stairs. The basket was pretty heavy. I strained my arm. I thought you said you fell. I did, carrying the clothes back up. Mrs. Miller, when was the last time Jared lost his temper here at home? A few days ago. Same day that you hurt your arm. Why don't you tell me what happened? Mommy, can we play with Legos, please? 
Not right now, honey. Daddy will be home soon. You know he doesn't like to see toys all over the place. Go on. Back to the living room. Please, have a seat at the table. Jared can have a temper. He yells and throws things sometimes, but he doesn't mean it. He's always sorry afterwards and says he won't do it again. Mrs. Miller, do you feel safe with Jared when he's angry? Of course I do. Well. <laughs> when he's mad, he can forget his own strength. But he doesn't mean to hurt me, and he's so sweet to bring me flowers and all. I know what sets him off. I just have to try harder not to let things happen. When Jared is angry with you, what does he usually do? Um, look, I know what you're getting at. He's not one of those men who beats his wife. He's under a lot of pressure, and sometimes he just loses his temper. Could you do something to help him with his temper? It's not often. How often is it? Well, he's not violent or anything. Just lots of yelling. Once he pushed me and then twisted my arm this time. Really, he's a good man. We need him here. Please don't tell him I told you this. God, don't tell him. He said he's not going to do it again. That's that. Well, I'll talk to Jared about counseling. And I won't tell him you've told me anything. Now, has he ever hurt or hit the children? He would never hurt the kids. He only spanks them when they don't follow the rules. He tells them it's for their own good so they won't become spoiled brats. When he gets too mad, I put them in the car and drive them to my sister's. Then I come back by myself until he settles down. Well, it sounds like you're trying to please Jared, but at the same time, trying to protect your children. Yeah. Most of the time, I know Jared's going to be right. He's the man of the house. He makes the important decisions. I just really stand up to him if it's something about the kids. Mrs. Miller, are there firearms here? No. Has Jared ever owned a rifle or handgun? No. When Jared began his supervision, he told me that he had a rifle that he used to hunt deer. Is that still here somewhere in the house? Oh. He used to have a rifle that belonged to his grandfather, but he gave it back. Have you noticed that he's used alcohol or drugs lately? He does drink some. He likes to go out with his friends. Is he more likely to get angry when he's been drinking or using drugs? Uh, sometimes. I try to be extra careful when he's been drinking. He's had some pretty bad fights at the bar. Mrs. Miller, are you able to do pretty much anything you want to do, or does Jared decide what you should do? I can do about anything I want. I just like to check with Jared first. He likes to know where I'm going and who I'm with. How does Jared check up on you? Sometimes he checks the car to make sure that I've gone where I said I was going. Does he ever threaten you? No. <laughs> He's a really sweet guy. He cares a lot about us and doesn't know what he would do without me and the kids. <laughs> I don't know what he would do if we were to leave. Well, Mrs. Miller, I'm concerned for your safety. Now, 
most of the time, the hitting and the pushing doesn't get better on its own. It'll get worse without getting any help. Now, we'll see what we can do for Jared, but what about you? Is there someone that can help you when he gets angry? Someone that can help you make decisions about your situation? I'm okay. I know how to handle Jared. Do you feel like you're in danger tonight? No. Well, if you ever feel like you're in danger, I want you to call 911 right away, okay? Now, I'm gonna give you one of my business cards and I'm going to put the number of the domestic violence agency in the back here. They can help with emergency shelter, safety planning, counseling services. Put this where you can find it easily. And if Jared is ever violent with you again, I want you to call me as soon as you get to a safe place, okay? Well, it looks like Jared's late today. Has he ever stopped anywhere on the way home from work? Um. Please trust that I'm not going to tell him that you told me anything. But I need to know everything if I'm going to help you and Jared. There's McNabb's bar on 4th off Broadway. Okay. If he's there, he'll be there a while. Okay, now give him this card. It'll tell him to come down to my office first thing in the morning, 8 o'clock, on the way to work. Just tell him I stopped by and left that for you, okay? Okay. All right. I'll do that. Welcome back, everybody. Uh, as you saw, Officer Williams did a really nice job uh, with that situation. Uh, probably got a little more than he bargained for walking into that situation, but he did a nice job managing it and uh, got some good information. Um, Hopefully you followed along with your uh, power and control wheel and noticed a number of the dynamics going on in that exchange. And uh, you know, one of the things I noticed was that uh, as he was talking to Megan, uh, you know, despite the obvious indicators that the uh, domestic violence was likely going on, there was, you know, on her part, just a lot of minimizing and denying that that was going on, uh, despite the evidence mounting as we went along. So, um, Nancy, as you watched it, I mean, what were some of the things that you saw that uh, were some indicators for you? Oh, I think there were lots of red flags. Um, I think Megan's pretty intimidated. She's uh, very much trying to um, toe the line, um, hold things together on that home front, not disappoint him, do things on his schedule. She also talked about his not knowing his own strength. That suggests to me that there's some recurring violence, even though it may not be hitting if he's using his strength in some way that she was able to say that. Um, the stuff about the kids is a concern. When things get really bad, she puts them in the car and takes them to her sisters. Um, I don't know if that's to, to protect, yeah, I mean, obviously it's to protect them from either the witnessing or from for something. Um, I also thought uh, that there's a, um, a, a real isolation thing happening there. She doesn't work outside the house anymore, although she used to. She. Um, uh, you know, he documents her use of the car, where she goes. She doesn't let people in if he's not home. Uh, that sort of directs us towards the, the isolation concern. I also felt that the male privilege thing is pretty obvious. Um, he's the man of the house and she does things. He does, his, you know, his decision making and she has her duties. And that's just the way it is. Um, no, didn't seem to be an equal playing field to me in that relationship. I also thought the economic issues were a concern. Um, she didn't have the, uh, the, the choices about how, how much money, uh, the, although they don't have much money right now, I mean, how money would be spent or used. There were, there were really, I think, a number of red flags there. Well, and one thing that struck me too is that we talked earlier about risk factors, and, and one of the things that um, they mentioned was the drug aftercare condition, the fact that he was hanging out at the bar and drinking, and. Uh, I think just a note to the officer in that kind of situation is that, um, you know, that's something you need to be aware of, that the, the stakes may be higher, that the risk for something happening is, is going to be greater because of some of those risk factors that are in place there. Uh, but I, I think the thing that can be said for that is Officer Williams did a nice job asking the right questions and got a lot of information. Um, Kelly, I don't know, what did you see there that, uh, that you liked as far as the way he guided that discussion? Well, he used a few basic interview techniques that are very helpful when you're talking to victims of abuse. This is not a relationship that probation officers are necessarily 
um, used to having. So they, we're used to having a relationships more with the offenders and we're, we're sure of our role in that situation. But with victims and with family members, this is kind of uncharted territory. Um, I took some notes. This offender has a, a record of harassment, and um, so Megan's hand was, uh, was a red flag to that. Um, he questioned her carefully and deliberately so as not to put her on the defensive. This is all in trying to build that relationship uh, with her. He used empathy. He acknowledged her clean house and um, her dinner making, her keeping all her children in a row. Um, trying to please Jared and protect the children. He, you know, used that empathy to make that connection with her. Second, he didn't use words like abuse, which would might immediately put her on the defensive, especially when she's trying to protect Jared as well. Um, he talked about the power play in their relationship subtly. He asked her, describe your relationship. He said, what kinds of things do you fight about? He said, um, what does Jared do when he gets angry? He just, um, you know, broached that subject uh, gently and uh, didn't use words that, uh, that put her on the defensive. Third, um, he used a line of questions so that when he began to ask Megan about her hand and then uh, he kind of thought she probably wasn't telling the truth, he dropped it, but he did come back to it. He made sure that he came back to that, and there were a couple other issues like that. Um, fourth, he asked, um, and then did a very good job, I thought, with open-ended and probing questions. Um, first, he used the open-ended questions and then, and then moved into closed questions. These are basic interview techniques. Um, he asked, how does Jared handle his anger? He didn't give her choices of does he do this, that, or the other thing and answer the question for her. He just left it and waited and allowed her to answer the question. Um, and then he probed for specific um, situations like the children, does he hit the children, are there firearms in the house? You know, then he asked those uh, closed questions. Um, the last note I just wanted to make um, here is about this relationship with victims. Um, in many ways, it's similar to relationships we might have as probation officers um, with confidential informants and can be a really good source of information to keep that relationship and those uh, lines of communication over open. Um, he also promised her confidentiality, which we can't always do with victims. But in this case, um, he knew he could uh, independently corroborate what she was saying to him with medical records and police reports, and he could get the information elsewhere. So he told her not to worry that he didn't have to tell Jared, um, you know, that they had had that discussion. But that's not always the case. I mean, you know, sometimes you can't, uh, you can't really control that. Well, and yeah, I mean, he just did a nice job of you know asking the right questions. He made her very feel very comfortable, as you noted, and, and as a result, I'm sure probably got more uh, cooperation and information from her. And I guess maybe the point to be made here is really that um, if you understand the dynamics of domestic violence and you know you're aware of the context, you ask the right questions and use good interview skills, um, you can get a lot of information in, in a relatively sh uh, short time. So. Um, that's, that's a good tool to, for officers to be aware of. Um, Nancy, let me ask you this then. We've gone about getting some information. We suspect that domestic violence is occurring within this relationship. How do we go about gathering some more information, maybe verifying what we know, uh, getting some supporting documentation, and, and kind of getting it organized into some useful format that we can use as we move toward maybe confronting the offender about um, his behavior? Viewers, if you will turn to page nine in your materials, there is a, a list and sort of a framework for organizing this, this wide variety of information you may be, may be collecting in this, these situations. The first thing to consider really are the facts of the presenting incident. Um, it should be uh, kind of an analysis of uh, w you know, what was the case here with the most recent violence and, and the probation officer did that. He, uh, determined what had happened a few nights earlier, looked at that. May involve figuring out who called 911, um, why, what people felt was happening when that happened, um, what, what were the effects of the violence. In this case, there was a hospital visit. So really, looking at the, the, the most recent incident, the presenting incident, to, to get the detail about it um, and uh, collect that in that first, uh, first piece of your information gathering. Um, the second um, piece, I think, uh, to consider is really the impact, as we've spoken of previously, of the violence and the abuse on the victim. 
What are, what's the physical impact? We got to see that with Megan. What's the emotional impact? Is she intimidated? Where, where, is, where are things at this point in time? Um, you know, any steps she's taking? Has she sought any order for protection? Has she received any um, support services, advocacy services um, in her own right? Is she taking steps towards a possible separation or something? I mean, those are the things so to consider. What effect has this most recent violence had within this family situation? The third uh, kind of uh, uh, place to put information and to check your information is to look for the presence, really, of risk factors um, and lethality indicators. And we have a list of those viewers in the back of our materials. And they bear watching because these relationships really are are um, in flux and um, risk can go up or down depending upon the situation. But we really want to look at, you know, is there separation is an enormous risk. So is, is there an impending separation? Is that a piece that may be happening? Um, are there other, um, is, the, is the violence escalating in frequency and severity? That kind of a, a setting. But there are a number of risk factors, I think, to screen for. Mental health factors. Um, Suicide is a huge, a suicidal ideation on the part of the perpetrator, suicidal, homicidal ideation. Those are huge risk factors to, to try to, uh, to at least screen for at this part of our, of our, uh, our information gathering. Um, next uh, category would be the presence of substance abuse issues and mental health issues. And again, um, uh, the su suicidal ideation, that kind of thing is huge, but obviously the substance abuse. And I think we're getting a sense that Jared is is um, reckless. I mean, he's had some dirty UAs and he's drinking and he knows those are, that, that he's willing to do that despite a court order. So that tells us there is a, there's an element there of, of, of uh, some serious abuse, I think. Current stressors. Now, this is a relationship that has uh, a number of stressors, I think. Um, they talked about their reduced circumstances financially. Um, that seems to be huge. Um, impact of having to go through treatment, having to go through job search, having to be on probation, that can be, that's a stressor within, if it's a stressor to the abuser, it's going to be a stressor in the relationship too. So uh, evaluating those current stressors, and he did a good job of that. He, he asked about them, he acknowledged them, and uh, so he, he has taken, you know, that inventory as well. The history and pattern of abuse in the relationship is another thing to consider. Um, the reason for doing that is to understand if things are escalating or things are deteriorating significantly. In this case, he found out that the parties had been together since uh, high school and, and it probably was not always as violent or as difficult as it's been of late. So he made sure to get, get some understanding about that dynamic in the relationship. And then the, lastly, the history of abuse with others. Um, Jared has had some bar fights and, and stuff, but she also mentioned he goes drinking with his buddy. So he has some male relationships, but it's a, uh, one more piece to consider the uh, history of abuse he has with others. So those are the interview items that he was able to identify. We also want to make really good use of the records that might be available to us. And sometimes the interviewing piece can direct us toward the, uh, the records that we're going to need to seek out. Viewers, if you'll also take a look at page 11 in your materials, there is a pretty um, thorough list of the kinds of records that you might be able to um, gather for purposes of your assessment. Um, first, we want to look at criminal justice records. And I would encourage all of us to not look only at convictions, but also at those cases which were dismissed and even 911 calls. Many domestic violence cases, and there's a high rate of dismissal with domestic violence uh, cases. So even though the case was dismissed, it is not an indicator that, that there wasn't a, a violent incident. So to look at um, not just convictions, but also look at charges um, and dismissals and even 911 calls and look for a pattern. Um, civil court records can be really important. Orders for protection, obviously, for those of you who don't routinely do it, NCIC has an uh, has a query that you can make relative to protective orders. That's the national registry, but each state has their own statewide registry, which gets fed into the NCIC. So you can get some sense of at least current records. State, NC, state um, registries will have some history as a rule. You might see an individual with a series of orders for protection brought by a variety of women or brought, brought by this same victim more than once. So checking for orders for protection. Things like divorces. You can look to see, has this person been divorced? Um, when? How long ago? Different part, you know, how many times? Those kinds of things can sometimes be an indicator if there have been sequential um, 
relationships. So civil court records, maybe even things like um, uh, unlawful detainers and money judgment records can give you a little bit of insight into the, this person's stressors and their situation. Uh, the third area are social service records, and this can be huge. If you, have, if you can determine that there have been open child protection cases, um, perhaps because of the domestic violence or chemical use and abuse or neglect, those can be really informative. Other kinds of social history records would be things like referrals for counseling or other kinds of, of community-based supervision or community-based treatment interaction. And the fourth category is medical and treatment records, people who have actually been referred for chemical health treatment in the past, maybe they've been referred, maybe there are hospital records as in Megan's case of treatment for, for injuries. So those are some of the records that I think we should attempt to access as part of this assessment. Wow, <laughs> I think Kelly and I are both going like, I mean, that's a lot of information you need to, to think about. And um, maybe, uh, is there something that officers can do to maybe boil that down and make it something that's uh, easy to manage and look at that might be a, a good tool for them as they you know, go about uh, confronting the, the offender, just to make it more digestible. Well, clearly the information that we've gathered will ha can be placed, it plugged into that, that little scenario, that list I just gave you. But one thing that's been helpful for me sometimes is just to make a timeline, to start out with a timeline um, uh, noting the noting the convictions, the current ones and any previous ones, and then layer in um, 911 calls and charges that might have been dismissed. And then on top of that, you can put in other you know periods of pr imprisonment or incarceration. And then any of these other pieces of information that you've got, issuance of orders for protection, um, uh, divorces, other kinds of things, if you can lay those into your timeline, you really can get a very um, interesting and dynamic picture of what's gone on with this individual. It also can help you determine if there's been, if things are, seem to be escalating or, uh, or deteriorating. It sounds like, I mean, I guess it sounds like if you do your homework, um, you know, you got something there that's going to be really useful to you in, in, in moving ahead with the case. Um, it's essential. Viewers, we do have a, another videotape that's going to illustrate what we've been talking about as far as preparing for the case planning interview. What I'd like you to do is just uh, take a minute to turn to page 12 in your participant guide, and there you'll find some guidelines on conducting a case planning interview. And what I'd like you to do is just kind of keep it open to that page as we watch uh, Officer Williams conduct his interview with the offender, Jared. Uh, just kind of follow along and, and pay attention to what uh, you see Officer Williams doing consistent with what's in your participant manual. Um, just to set it up just quickly, um, he's called uh, Jared to his office uh, and he's going to confront him with the information and put his preparation to use. So uh, let's watch. Jared, I left word for you to come down here today because you didn't show up for your appointment on Wednesday. Uh, well, you know, I didn't have time because I uh, got busy at work, so could call. Well, if you're going to miss an appointment, I expect the courtesy of a phone call, okay? Yeah. Now, the breathalyzer shows 0.04. What is alcohol doing in your system at lunchtime? <laughs> I have no idea. I didn't drink anything this morning. Well, what about last night? I went out with a few of the guys from work, and I had, I had two beers, so that must be it. Jared, I think two beers would be long gone from your system by now. I think you had a few more than that. What time did you get home? I was home by 10. I had two beers, and that's it. All right, well, let's talk about something else. Records from the clerk's office show you have not yet made a payment towards restitution. You're supposed to pay 10% of your gross salary each month. Yeah, yeah. I'm a little bit behind on that. See, my wife, she hurt her arm, and I had to take her to the emergency room. So I had to pay for that, so I couldn't make the court payment. Well, I'd like to see the ER paperwork your wife brought home from the hospital. I need to verify that expense, okay? No problem. All right, uh, now, can you... Uh, Make a payment from your next paycheck. We could set up a court date to amend the restitution order if it's too much. Look, just don't worry. I'll make the payment. I told you. It's just the doctor's bills. Yeah, your wife's arm. I saw it was bandaged. How did that happen again? She, she fell on the stairs. She's like a real drama queen, so, you know, I took her to the hospital. And the doctor says it's just a little bruise. So... When does probation end? You know you have three years left. All right, next topic. How's the job going? 
I can't get enough hours on that. I mean, you know, sometimes they don't work because of the weather or they don't need me depending on where the job is. Well, I talked to your supervisor and he did say that uh, they can't always use you. He said you're doing a good job, though. Uh, but you do have a lot of financial responsibilities, and it's important that you remain employed with Casey until something better comes along. And did you check out those referrals for employment counseling I gave you? Mm. They should be able to uh, get you a full-time job that pays better than what you're getting now. Yeah, well, no, I haven't gone down there yet, but I will this week. But it's, you know, I just don't have the time. It's like you said, if there's work, I need the money. Well, yeah, you, you do need money. And you also need a lot less stress in your life as well. Why don't you try going after work? I mean, the employment agency is open until 7 o'clock. They have uh, clients just like yourself who work during the day and go after work. Now, they should be able to help you find a better job in less time with less aggravation. Why don't you give them a call on Monday and then give me a call, let me know how it goes. Okay. All right, I'll go, but, you know... Ten years in the post office doesn't exactly give you much experience to do anything else. Yeah, well, that's exactly why you should go. Ask them about training. I know they have a heating, ventilation, and air conditioning program that pays pretty good. They have other programs, too. Yeah, my cousin did something like that. He made pretty decent money, so... All right, I'll check it out. Okay, great. Now, back to those two beers <laughs> last night. Now, you say you got home about 10 o'clock? <laughs> I didn't do any drugs last night. Well, that's about the only good thing we can say about last night, isn't it? You're not allowed to drink alcohol, Jared. You're risking your freedom by drinking. It shows it's too important to you. And even if you just had two beers, which I seriously question, it's still too many. Does that make sense? Yeah. Now, about the drugs. I see you uh, tested positive for marijuana two weeks ago. But I asked the guy if I was positive. The guy takes a test, and he said that you'd tell me if I was. Since I didn't hear anything from you, I just figured I was all right. Well, that test takes a long time to come back. It's much different than the breathalyzer. Jared, are you smoking pot every day? Or once in a while? Look, or... it's just once in a while. I've stopped. I have. I quit. You can test me right now if you want. I had the beers. I probably had more than two beers, but man... I quit the weed. Well, I appreciate your honesty, Jared. You're going to need to tell me the truth if we're going to work together. But be careful. Now, we'll have a UA test done to make sure the levels of metabolite have decreased enough to show that you've quit the weed. But you're really pushing the envelope here, let me tell you. You've been under supervision four months. Already, we're going back to the judge with a violation. And we're not going to recommend any sanctions this time, but you can bet we will in the future if you don't get your act together. What's a sanction? A sanction is a consequence of a violation of probation. It could be community service, could be home confinement, could be halfway house placement. But the judge does not have to follow our recommendation. He could put you in jail. Remember the day you were sentenced? Yeah. Well, you could be standing in the same spot in the same courtroom trying to explain to the judge why you drank two beers, were smoking dope, and failed to pay towards restitution. All right. I'll do better. I swear. Can't we do anything else? Well, there's drug treatment. Now, have you called the treatment program yet? I called, but there was no answer. I called. I called twice. Jared, we talked about this several times. You agreed to go. Now, the program is open every day until 5 for referrals and intake. They have treatment groups that meet in the evening for those who work. Now, I expect that you make an appointment today and call me on Monday. If I'm not there, leave a message. They will fax over a confirmation as soon as you have attended your first intake session. Now, you've showed up regularly for your drug test. So continue to check for your number and come in on the days you're supposed to. Got it? Yeah. All right, now I learned something this morning that's very disturbing. Last Friday, there was a 911 call to your house about a domestic disturbance. Your wife didn't press charges, but the police report indicates she suffered minor injuries and that you were drunk and uncooperative. <laughs> that bitch! She's the one who told you this stuff, isn't she? Calm down, Jared, calm down. When you're in this office, I expect that you use language that's appropriate when you refer to your wife. Now, 
I found this information out independently, okay? Now the police report, if you check this out, copy the police report with the 911 call on it, you can see, you know, I did not ask your wife anything and she did not tell me anything. I did learn some other things though. According to your pre-sentence report, you have a previous charge for assault against your wife in which you were allowed to plead to harassment. That was a long time ago and nothing's happened since then. I, I had a couple of beers and she got all mad. I work hard to support her and those kids, and this is the thanks I get? Look, she came at me. All I did was back off so that she wouldn't hit me, and she fell down the stairs. She was yelling and crying, and the kid was crying, and it was the nosy neighbor who called the cops. Megan's not going to press charges. And the cops, they didn't arrest me because they knew nothing had happened. What a pain in the ass. The old lady falls down, and I get blamed for it. Use your wife's name. OK. Megan's as clumsy as a cow. She's hurting herself all the time. Your wife is not a cow. That's bullshit. Megan hurts herself just so that she can blame me. All right, now, Jared, the police report is clear that your wife did not hurt herself, all right? You were using threats, violence, and intimidation to get her to do what you want her to do. I don't abuse my wife. I love her. We've been together since high school. She comes from a broken family. Her father's a drunk, and I took her away from all that. How does a man supposed to keep his house together? I provide the money and the discipline. She cooks and she cleans. That's just the way it is. Jared, a man is not allowed to use abuse and violence to control his wife and kids, okay? Domestic violence is a crime. Now, one of the terms of your probation is you're not allowed to commit any more crimes. And if you're battering your wife and kid, you're committing a crime. Yeah, 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 whatever. All right, well, I'm not going to argue with you about this. I want an expert opinion. I want you to go for a domestic violence assessment. When we get the report back, then we'll figure out what to do. <laughs> no way. I'm not crazy. I'm not going for any assessment, whatever that is. I don't batter, or whatever you call it, my wife. I don't batter anyone. Everybody has the right to get mad every now and then. You would, too, if you weren't making the money you're used to and the wife and kids and bills are down your throat all the time. Man, if I could just make more money, things would get better. I know that you're under a lot of pressure financially, but I don't think making more money is the answer to this situation with your wife. Using violence against your wife and children at any time is against the law. The assessment that I'm asking you to participate in will assess the extent and severity of abuse within your family and the risk for future problems. It will involve interviews with you and Megan, as well as a review of court and other records. It will give us some recommendations to improve the safety of your family. No. I'm going to schedule a court hearing and ask the court to impose a special condition that you participate in a domestic violence assessment and any treatment recommended as a result of the assessment. Contact your lawyer today and tell him we'll be in court soon. You can explain to the judge why you shouldn't have this assessment after hurting your wife, after the police were at your house, and you were drinking that night. Okay, I'll go. But it was her fault. She fell. You know I pushed her, but I never punched her. Well, maybe once, but she was coming at me. Damn woman. You have a right to a court hearing before this special condition is imposed, and you have a right to be represented by counsel at that hearing. Or the court may impose the condition without a hearing if you waive it. Now, this waiver that I'm asking you to sign includes the condition that the court would impose. Please read this waiver carefully and sign it if you understand it, and you agree that the condition can be imposed without the hearing. All right, now let me warn you that if you hit your wife or otherwise harm her or anyone else, it is a violation of your probation, and I will ask the court to issue a warrant for your arrest. Is that clear? Yes. Keep your hands to yourself. All right. Now, I want to see you again next week at the same time. Here's an appointment card and a list of things that you need to do here. All right. Now, make the first payment on your fines and court costs by the end of the month. No drugs or alcohol. And make an appointment at the drug treatment agency today. I gave you the name and address. Do you still have it? Mm-hmm. Good. 
All right, call me on Monday to let me know when your intake appointment is. Go to the employment agency on Monday after work. And remember, no violence of any kind to anyone, including your wife and kids. Now we're going to call the domestic violence agency now to set up an appointment for an assessment. I'll dial, and you talk. Hello? Yeah, this is Jared Miller. Welcome back. Well, once again, Officer Williams does a nice job uh, managing that situation. Uh, I think he's like my new supervision officer role model. I'm going to have to try and be a little bit more like him. Uh, I think the point to be made here is that he did a really nice job. He, he was obviously prepared, uh, as we talked about earlier. Uh, he had a good handle on what was going on and asked the right questions. Um, Kelly, as you were watching that, um, what are some of the interview skills and some of the things that you saw that you liked that Officer Williams did? Um, well, there are a few things. Um, he used some of the same techniques that he used with Megan, but this relationship and the tone of the interview was very different. Um, his relationship with Megan, he's very um, empathetic and helpful, and the interview went like that. Um, with Jared, however, he's, um, he's supportive, but he makes it clear that there are things that he expects Jared to do, and he'll certainly enforce consequences um, if they're not done. Um, first off, he, al he didn't uh, allow Jared to blame Megan. He didn't allow uh, Jared to minimize the behavior. And both of these things are, are very common among abusers. Um, secondly, he confronted Jared's denials with information that's irrefutable, like UA reports, police reports, medical reports. He had the documentation to refute his denials. Um, I liked when Jared denied smoking pot and uh, Officer Williams let it go for a while and then when he came back to it, he said, he gave him a choice. Do you smoke pot a little bit or do you smoke it every day? Because that allowed Jared to, his guilt will talk if, if it's, you know, caught off guard. So his guilt did talk and he said a little bit. But meanwhile, Officer Williams had what he needed, which was the admission that Jared uh, did smoke pot. Um, third, um, he was very clear about his expectations uh, for Jared and the conditions uh, of his supervision. He um, not only told Jared what he expected to do, but gave him a very firm and uh, uh, tight timeline, I thought. You know, next week you must do this, you have to call me after you call the treatment facility, that kind of thing. Um, fourth, he didn't argue with Jared. I thought Jared baited him a couple times to try to get him into an argument, and uh, he just didn't take the bait. He, uh, when Jared started to lose his temper, um, he knows that this individual has a propensity to violence, right, because of, of everything that's gone on. So when Jared starts to lose his temper, he changes the subject temporarily, knowing he's going to come back to it, but it gives Jared a chance to cool off a little bit. Um, finally, he didn't... Uh, collude with the abuser. He didn't um, allow him to call Megan names. Um, he didn't commiserate with any personal information. He just didn't collude with the, uh, with the, uh, with, with Jared at all. So uh, that, those are the things that I saw. Yeah, I agree. Anything to add, Nancy, on, on that end? I mean, um, no, I mean, I think he was, he was very specific and I like that. I'll dial you talk. <laughs> that was a nice way to end it. Well, and what we're going to do now is, you know, we've, we've used our knowledge of dynamics of domestic violence to, to gather some information. We've got supporting documentation. We've confronted the offender about his behavior and, and kind of moving toward case planning. How are we going to respond and intervene in this situation? Um, first of all, what we need to understand is that there are three goals in terms of case planning that we need to really be mindful of before we uh, do anything. And those are, the first thing you want to do is to stop the violence. And secondly, you want to hold the uh, offenders accountable for their behavior. And lastly, you want to work to change abusive behavior and thinking patterns. So, given what we know uh, up to this point, um, Nancy, what are some strategies that officers can use uh, really to manage these cases in terms of uh, you know, intervention and referral? Well, with, um, when you supervise the case or when you're doing your case planning, you want to first look at sanctions. And whatever is a pro an appropriate sanction to the behavior and the level of offense, um, you need to, to uh, look at that first. I would say that you should be cautious about home confinement. 
in domestic abuse cases if the offender is going to be confined with, a, with their victim. That would be a concern, but sanctions, whatever is appropriate. The second thing are just to look at your regular standard conditions, the standard conditions and special conditions you already have in place. In this case, the officer had a no-use condition. He had um, uh, the ability to do home visits. He certainly had the ability to mandate office visits. He had the, he had the ability to test, breathalyze, um, and urinalysis. Use those things. You might ratchet up the frequency and the intensity, make it um, a more intense surveillance almost, but, but use the conditions you have and use them fully. And same with special conditions. If you have treatment conditions and so forth that you can direct the person towards appropriate treatment, do it, do it quickly. Make it, make it happen sooner rather than later and in the tight time frame that we saw Officer Williams use. The third thing would be to um, really consider some appropriate intervention strategies for, for a domestic violence situation and that would involve a look at the kind of, of perpetrator you have, the kind of risk he poses and what, what level of intervention is appropriate. We'll talk about that in a second. The fourth thing is to maintain contact with the victim and I think that's the tough part for for probation officers. We're used to, um, you know, when we've talked before, we've said we, we're comfortable in our role with offenders, we're less so with victims. But you really need to do that here. And it should not always be us responding to their call with a concern. It should be us initiating the contact and a che on a check-in basis, um, doing it on our terms, not always theirs. So that would be the, the fourth piece um, about the, uh, the uh, supervision is that victim contact. But I want to go back for a minute to something you said about the domestic violence intervention programs. And I think this is an important point we don't want to gloss over. Not everything works with every offender, and it kind of gets back to understanding the context and what kind of offender you're dealing with, what kind of abuser you're dealing with. Can you just spend a little bit more time talking about what's appropriate in, in which cases? Sure. Um, viewers, you might look at page 14 and 15 in your materials. We've tried to just um, uh, define several kinds of common treatment interventions um, for your use there. The, there are different interventions depending upon the kind of, of abuse that's going on, but basically there are three types. The first is education-based programming, and education-based programming is more geared towards uh, the person who is um, the low-risk offender, low level of violence, maybe not the entrenched power and control model. Um, those programs are often based on a, 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 a format of, of a presentation around certain things like um, emotional regulation, um, uh, good communicate, better communication, parenting issues, um, followed by some discussion, 10 to 20 hours in length perhaps, and uh, uh, appropriate for that, that type of offender, a lower level offender. The second uh, type of, of programming is a more heavy duty therapy based program, and there will certainly be educational concepts in that format. However, it will also be geared towards um, each participant understanding the power and control dynamics and incorporating some changes into their, their own behavior. And the, as, as you would expect, those programs are longer. They're going to be 20 to, you know, anywhere from, from 20 to 60 or even more hours in length, uh, maybe as many as, uh, you know, two to six months of, of therapy. So that would be the second kind. Um, we do see referrals for anger management on, on occasion, but I think we have to be cautious about those and really understand the content of the program. Anger management is really about emotional regulation, and it would be for that person who's angry in a lot of contexts, not just in the family. So the person who's got road rage and drives around with high blood pressure, I mean, it, I, you know, that's an example, but, um, and it may be appropriate in conjunction with uh, domestic violence counseling um, as well. The thing that I would encourage us to all avoid is any couples counseling when we have an untreated batter in that setting because it really can put the, the victim at risk. But before we move on, I would like to say just a word about working with a provider. And on page 17 in your materials, we do have some tips for that. But really look at the programs in your jurisdiction. See what's out there. If there are state standards in your community for um, regulating program content and, and so forth, try to go with a program that's, that is, meets those state standards or guidelines or license, whatever might be appropriate. Um, make sure you get a lot of releases and good documentation. It doesn't pay to use programs that won't provide you with any information. And so, um, you know, negotiate that up front and get, get all that information um, from them and to them. They'll want information from you, arrest reports and any information that can assist them. 
The third thing is to really understand and make sure your clients understand what the rules are so that um, if they can't follow them, what the consequences might be. If it's two misses and you're out, your client needs to know that and what that might mean for, for their probation. Um, the fourth thing would be to really understand the curriculum. If you can understand the curriculum, you can then reinforce those concepts in your interviews with your client. How is your self-control plan going? What sort of um, escalation have you had over the past week? How did you deal with it? Because you understand what the program expects and, and how he is um, doing his assignments and what he's supposed to be gaining. Thank you. I mean, and I think it's just something we don't think enough about as far as which offenders we should be referring to which program. So I think it's important information to get out there. I want to shift our focus just for a minute. Um, I know earlier you mentioned victim and, and, and maintaining contact with the victim. And I got to say, I think this is probably one of the, the biggest areas of frustrations for, for officers involved in these cases. Uh, as you stated earlier, I mean, we know what to do with offenders and we know how to deal with noncompliance. Uh, the waters get a little muddied when we're dealing with victims. We're not sure what our role is. We don't, you know, really know how to handle that sometimes. And uh, it, it can be an extremely uh, frustrating thing to deal with. Um, Kelly, I, I want to direct this to you because I know you um, just completed a training program not too long ago in your district for your officers around domestic violence. And maybe you could just talk for a minute about um, some of the questions and comments that they presented to you uh, as a result of that training. I, I did have an opportunity to speak um, to six different groups of officers and um, I think we've addressed most of the concerns that they brought up around this issue but there were two questions that kept coming up over and over again. One of them was why does she stay? Why doesn't she just leave? And the other one was what if she's calling me to tell on her husband but it's not true? What if she's calling just to get him in trouble and that and the and the violence is not occurring what if I don't believe her so those were the two questions that that came up over and over again when I can I can totally relate to the first one in particular um, just looking back on recent cases um, you know we can do all the things we've been talking about in terms of you know making sure the victim's safe and trying to make the appropriate referrals and confronting the the offender on their behavior and, and, and uh, implementing proper sanctions and, and next thing you know the next day they're calling them and they're back living together and I mean it, it's just terribly frustrating and I don't know Nancy maybe you got some good advice to really well, kind of help us stay focused a little bit. You can't do this work without having that question come up all the time even if you know the answer you still have to keep reminding yourself. Um, viewers if you want to uh, uh, take a look in your materials on pages 20 through 22 there's a list of, of victim risk issues but I think it's really helpful to review those in consideration of why victims make the decisions they do. Um, there are lots of risks for her, and some of them are not um, what you might expect. You know, she has the obvious risks from her batterer. You know, this risk of injury, risk of, of, of social alienation, loss of her children, all those kinds of things. But you can add to that just risks in life. Um, how does the violence, you know, and reporting the violence might affect her housing, her ability to work, her schooling, her immigration. Um, in addition to that, there are lots of risks with going through our criminal justice system. Most victims, you know, as we know, don't call the police because they want a divorce. They call the police because they want the violence to stop. And they, they look to the system to help stop the violence, not necessarily to end the relationship. It, it, and some victims look for help in assisting with the end of a relationship. But, but many times that's not the purpose. So if we assume that's the purpose or assume that should be their purpose, we are actually, I think, setting ourselves up for some disappointment. Um, the other area that I think is huge is the issue of separation risks, which are listed on page 23 of your materials. It may not be safe to leave, and it may not even be a good decision to leave. So to expect it or to direct our, you know, our efforts toward that might actually be a bad thing. So I think, um, I mean, most of the domestic homicides have occurred in the context of estranged estrangement or separation. So um, it may not be a good decision to leave. So just to bear that in mind when you when you do it it's really about us participating in a process of safety for her accountability for our client and um, um, not to to have any expectations about the outcome of the relationship well maybe we could deal with the second part of that question I think that uh, Kelly brought up what, what if you just don't believe the victim what they're telling you 
Well, and some victims don't always sound believable. I mean, we're assuming that they're going to, you know, you mean, there again, we have some assumptions that may or may not be valid. But I think we're not the finders of fact. Courts are the finders of fact. And if, in order for her to bring a violation that's credible and it has to be provable, and we have some, you know, we have to follow whatever procedures we have. But I would also caution you to remember that lots of times victims have very inflated views of what the probation officer can and can't do. They may assume, they may have a false sense of security, they may assume that you can somehow, you know, whip him into shape and make this whole thing better. And so I think it's important to, to, to listen, be empathic, but to then remember that we need to remind them of how, what our limitations are, what we can and cannot do so that there is no sense of false security. Um, because we can't ensure their safety. Well, and I guess maybe what I'm hearing from you is probably some of this is normal in officers as they deal with these domestic violence cases um, should probably expect uh, recanting and maybe returning to the relationship and those kinds of things and, and maybe patience and persistence uh, will pay off eventually. Yeah, um, stay focused on the process. Yeah. I don't think it'll make it any less frustrating but um, Maybe we could just talk a little bit about, you know, given the frustration and some of the challenges of these cases, you know, what are some things that officers can do to kind of stay focused uh, on, on the important things as we move through these cases? Well, um, we talk in our office about the way not to mess up is to really don't get thrown off course by that predictable behavior. The victim recants and retreats. Expect it. Prepare for it. Do what you need to to, to be uh, prepared and uh, and keep focused on, on uh, the... Um, the uh, safety goal. Um, but secondly, again, don't sweat the fate of the relationship. You have no control over that. Third, you want to stay focused on your offender's behavior and his accountability. And fourth, your assessment has to be ongoing. These relationships are fluid. You may think you got it all, you know, patched up one day and the next day it's not, but it's a, it's a constant process of assessment. And last, changing behavior is a slow process requires a lot of accountability. People don't change easily. Good advice. Thank you. Um, we're eventually coming to the end of our program here. I guess, um, is there anything else that uh, we didn't cover that uh, requires comment? Can you, either of you think of anything that uh, in the closing moments of the program here that we need to cover? I just wanted to touch on the frustration of these cases and the fact that there's three people involved in this relationship and all have differing goals. The officer just, it's the officer, the offender, and the victim. And the officer just wants the offender to adhere to the conditions of his supervision, right? The, the offender just wants to keep doing what he's doing. And the victim um, just wants the violence to stop, not like Nancy said, necessarily for her marriage to end. So we have three people in this relationship that may have diametrically opposed um, goals about the whole situation. And I think that's where a lot of the frustration lies. I just, oh, I'm sorry. I just wanted to say one other thing about, um, uh, about when you have an, uh, someone calling you, giving you information, the wife calling you and giving you information, and that is, you know, we have these, ha this happens on cases all the time, on all different kinds of cases. We always have people calling us, trying to rat out our offenders. Okay. And we, we need to not let the fact that this is a domestic violence case muddy that water. We deal with that the way we would deal with any other uh, piece of information of somebody just calling out of the blue to rat out an offender. So you try to independently corroborate and you take the action as necessary, but I, I just don't think we need to, because it's a domestic violence case, that we need to get uh, you know, stuck in, in place. Yeah. And some good things to keep in mind, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, we're to the end of our program. I, I know I learned a lot just getting ready for the program and our discussions together as we got ready. Um, I'm light years ahead of where I was before now, and I hope viewers uh, that you walked away with something as well that helps you stay focused and maybe reduces some of that frustration as you uh, have these cases and have to manage them. Um, just a couple things to keep in mind, the importance of understanding the dynamics, uh, using your interview skills, always being aware of those red flags and, and what to do with them. Um, you're going to be you're going to be okay. So thank you for your time today. Um, I would also encourage you to use that participant guide as a resource. There's some good resources in the back, websites and articles. Um, use that as you have these cases and need to refer back to it. Uh, thank you very much, and I'm going to throw it back to Phyllis. John, thank you so much, Kelly, Nancy. That was a terrific program. I know that I learned a lot sitting here and listening to it, and also working with you people where we were uh, planning out the program. 
Viewers, thank you for turning in and I, tuning in, and I'd also like to remind you to please fill out your evaluations. We're most interested in hearing your reactions to today's program. And uh, that wraps up the program. Thank you. Have a great day.